Welcome to our saddle fitting webinar. Looks like we have everything working this week. If you were present in the past and had any issues, we're going to make it work this time around. If you're watching this on the YouTube video, if you want to send a chat, you'll need to go back to your webinars on air uh, chat room to actually send the chat. So we'll go ahead and get started here with saddle fitting. Now this, this is a going to be a quick summary because the topic of saddle fitting really is much more extensive and almost every one of these slides could actually be a 20 minute uh, piece of a lecture. So this will be kind of a whirlwind, but I do have a saddle fitting book for Western and for English, and we do have a 15% discount um, code at the end of this. So that's where all the information resides, is inside that book. So saddles are kind of a necessary evil. We, we really need them. They are mostly a rigid structure. There are certainly flexible, more flexible saddles available now, but um, those have their own issues. So we look at it as a, it's a structure between a dynamic rider on top and a dynamic horse on the bottom. And those things are moving and the saddle is not moving in the same kind of a way. The saddle is the communication device between the horse and the rider. And if the saddle isn't working, it really is a major contributor to poor performance. With, um, we're going to just run quickly through here with some of the things that might tip you off that you have a saddle fitting problem. Any horse that's showing an objection to being saddled is usually complaining honestly about the saddle not fitting. And that you occasionally will have a horse that's just become grumpy about being saddled and, and really does not have a saddle fitting problem, but most of them have an issue. It may be with the saddle, it may be that their back is sore from another injury and the saddle is, is bothering it, but one way or another, if they're showing an objection, it is from uh, the saddle. Horses that either don't move around much in the field or spend an excessive amount of time bucking and rolling, trying to loosen up their backs, both can be painful. The ones that don't move much in the field are too sore to move and the others are trying to stretch themselves out. A lot of horses are slow to warm up, and certainly if they're 20 years old, then uh, that's, um, you know, they're allowed to be a little bit slow, but we see a lot of, of young, much younger horses, under, well under 10 years old, that are slow to warm up because they really have to get their back, keep their back from hurting. Horses that are slow to leave a starting gate, whatever style of starting gate for the sport, they oftentimes have back pain. Horses that are resistant to work. There are certainly horses that don't care for the job that they have, that don't like the sport, but um, most of the time they're willing to go and do their job. And the more resistant they get to work, the more, re the more they get resistant as you are working, the more likely they are to have pain somewhere. Many, many times it'll be the back. Sometimes you have to be a little bit of a, um, of a, of a sleuth to find out exactly where they are um, uncomfortable. And then in many different sports, we're looking for them to collect. We're looking for them to maintain impulsion. All of these things are things that we try to achieve that if the horse is sore or the saddle is inhibiting those movements, then um, we are uh, going to have issues trying to get them to do what we are asking them to do. They're resistant to training aids or you seem to find you have to use all kinds of training aids to make maintain whatever frame it is 
or, or head position you want. Horses that are difficult to shoe often have back pain and to stand in a torqued position for the farrier becomes very uncomfortable and it may or may not have anything to do with their lower legs. Horses that shy excessively, except for the Arabians, they have sort of a shying gene, but horses that most breeds of horses, if they have an excessive amount of shying, they're uncomfortable. They're not focused on what you're doing. They may be hypersensitive to being touched um, or brushed. That generally indicates discomfort. A lot of bad attitudes. Most horses really do not have bad attitudes. They really want to do what we want them to do. They really want to work with us. And uh, that usually means that they have pain. And as we are trying to get them into the frame or into our shape that we want for our sport, horses that are unwilling or unable to really round themselves and use their back or neck. And there's many more signs or symptoms that you can find in the book. If we start looking at the horse itself, we want to palpate their back, feel those muscles, and look at the shape of the back muscles. So you can have scars or hard places in the muscle underneath the saddle area, atrophy of the back muscles. You can almost see the impression of the saddle in this horse's back. Often you'll see that atrophy at the side of the uh, withers depending on where the saddle is causing pressure. And as they get painful, they actually will begin to drop their backs down. So an old horse in their 20s might have a swayed back or a lowered back, but horses in their, their you know, five, eight, 10 years old, 15 years old really should not be dropping their back down. So now we're going to, check the structure of the saddle. And the problem with a lot of saddles is as an industry, there's not a lot of quality control. There's not a lot of, there's no regulation. Saddle companies can sell you a $5,000 saddle um, and nobody's gonna check it, check it out and see whether it's safe to drive. So you have to learn to check your own saddles. And uh, I go through it, actually have a whole chapter in the book on checking the saddle to make sure that the structure and the shape of it is correct. So you'll have saddles that have been damaged and you will have saddles that were actually manufactured unevenly. So if you look at the shape of the panels on the bottom of the saddle, and you see that the shape of the panels are different on each side, that's going to affect the horse. The information coming from the rider is gonna be different from one side to the other, so their performance going in one direction or the other is going to be different. So you might think that you're having trouble getting the right lead or turning to the left, and it might actually be that the horse is getting a completely different set of information from you going in different directions. On the top side, if the structure of the rider side is uneven, then you're going to find that the rider gets thrown out of balance. So in number two here, the flaps on the right-hand side stick forward farther than on the left. So your leg is going to tend to drift farther forward and there's gonna be not much you can do about it. Then we wanna take the saddle and put it across our knee and check to see if the structure is sound, to check to see if the tree is sound. So in three and four, what we have is putting some pressure diagonally across the tree and making sure that both sides are the same. And then you'll have a little bit of give in the tree but you should have the same amount of give on both sides and it shouldn't be significant. If you have a known tree that is flexible, then it is going to be, um, it is going to have more flexibility. So you do have to know what your tree is made of when you're doing this test. And then 
we're going to put our hands underneath and feel where the stirrup bars are because the stirrup bars themselves can be set on unevenly and that is going to cause the rider to ride unevenly. You can't see underneath these flaps, underneath the, this piece of leather. So you're going to have to do it by feel and you may need to put your hands in place and have a friend watch to see how it's working. The same thing we go through with the Western saddle. It's not quite as easy to put up on our leg. So we put it down on the ground and look down from the top side, the rider side. We want to make sure that the seat looks even, that the back of the cantle is even so that we can sit in a balanced way. If it's a used saddle, we can gain a lot of information from looking at the wear pattern on the suede, especially when the seats are suede. But depending on the leather that they're made, sometimes it can be very obvious that the rider is sitting crooked. Now, the rider could certainly be crooked in their own body, but the rider also can be made to be crooked by the, uh, by the unevenness of the saddle. Then we want to look at the saddle from the bottom side, which is the horse side, and look at the wear that's on the fleece that is present. So in this particular example, we can see that there's not much wear on the fleece in the middle, and there's quite a bit of wear and compression on the fleece at either end. So that means that the horse is feeling pressure at the ends and not so much in the middle, which we would call bridging. We can look at the Western saddle from the front and look for evenness of the angles of the bars and even this in the way the fork is attached. With the Western saddle, we can actually use a piece of string and we can measure and see where our girth billets would be attached. Where on the English saddle, we're stuck with feeling underneath the uh, side flaps in order to find the billets. So now we get to put the saddle on the horse. Now that we've decided that it's even and symmetrical. And the position is probably one of the most important aspects of the fit because we need the saddle to fit behind the shoulder blades. So you can kind of see some of the anatomy in the bottom picture. And we want the weight of the saddle to be over the rib cage. We can have extra skirt in the Western saddle. We can have an extra piece of the panel in an English saddle that sticks out behind into the lumbar area, but we can't have any pressure on it. So we need the saddle to fit behind the shoulder blade all the way to the last rib. And again, if we have some skirting material or a jumping flap that goes over the shoulder, that's gonna be fine as long as there's no pressure there. When the saddle's in the right place, that will also allow the rider to be balanced. The tree itself needs to fit the horse and it needs to be the shape of the horse's back. So trees are usually made out of something rigid, wood or steel. They can be made out of plastics. They can be made out of rubber. We're seeing some generally engineered, um, quite highly engineered trees in some saddles. And some of those ideas are going to be great. And some of those ideas are not going to work nearly so well because they aren't really the shape of the horse or they have a little bit too much flexibility in one place. We want that tree to conform to the shape of the horse's back and we know that there are many, many different horses back shapes out there. So there is no one brand of saddle, no one tree that's going to fit every single horse. And the whole idea with the tree is that it really is like fitting a shoe because the horse's back muscle is what gets compressed into 
the uh, the spine actually and so the horse's back muscle is soft it's in between the rigid structure just like inside a shoe and then on the bottom you have the horse's rib cage and spine so it's the muscle that takes the abuse if the saddle is not the right shape so we want the the front of the tree and and the things that i talk about hold just as true for western as english it doesn't really matter which picture i have up here one or the other they're both the same aspect of fitting they just look different so this tree area at the back behind the shoulder blade is what needs to be parallel to the withers so that you use the entire side of the withers and that muscle there to support the rider's weight we then need it to clear the withers we don't need any part of the saddle putting any pressure on the spine as it goes down the back because there's no muscle covering it to protect it any tree pressure is just like having um, somebody banging on your shin bone so the tree needs to miss it the bars need to miss it and the panels need to miss it so we want this tree to fit the contours of the horse's back and not put any pressure so the western the long western tree which can be a big problem on many horses and this first picture at the top the tree is too long for the horse's back but it's following the contour of the back very well it's not poking into it so we can put some skirting on this tree that will keep the pressure off of the lumbar area and just keep it on the rib cage because it's following the same shape as the horse's back if we look at the the bottom left hand tree you can see how that tree is not following the contour of the horse's back and we're going to end up with all of our pressure up close to the spine and no pressure out to the side and then we have a close-up view of the tree the contour a little bit better in the bottom right hand corner if we end up with our trees that are too long, which is very common, we end up with all of our pressure in the lumbar area. And the horse's back is not strong in that area. So here's some cross sections. Again, they, they hold tr just as true for English as for Western. We want to have the tree parallel to the horse's withers. We want to have it parallel in the middle of the saddle. And we want to have it parallel at the back of the saddle. So that's what it takes to follow the contours. When the tree is too wide, what happens is that it still has to contact the horse somewhere. So when the tree is wide, it is going to be tighter at the top of the angle and loose down at the bottom. So if you feel with your fingers up underneath the bottom of the tree, you'll have a gap, but it will still, it will feel very tight close to the withers. When the tree is too narrow, what you actually will feel is that it's too tight at the bottom and it's looser at the top. So the angle changes. So you really see it as being too tight at the bottom. And that will hold true anywhere you, and you can slide your hand underneath the tree itself, underneath the saddle and feel where, where it feels tightest against your fingers. And that actually can be quite accurate. If you practice a bit, it can tell you almost as much information as a computer. So here's some more bars and panels showing the angle at the back of the saddle. So the angle in this top right hand uh, picture is too steep of an angle. So it's too narrow and it's tight at the bottom and loose at the top. 
And because it's too narrow, you can look over on the right-hand side and you can actually see the bridging that's occurring. You can see the gap with all the pressure at the back of the saddle and pressure will be up at the front and there's no support for the horse in the middle. And we're just showing using the anatomy when you have contact all the way along the panel or the bar it's going to support that muscle in a very kind way we miss that middle spine because there's nothing really across the spine except for a little bit of a ligament and some skin and the muscle tissue right on either side of the spine is actually also not very springy. It's very fibrous. So we need to miss that. And sort of three and a half to four inches of space is what we feel. If the bars are at the incorrect angle, then we end up with a pressure point that goes straight down into the muscle itself. The gullet or the center, the gu it's usually called the gullet in the English saddles, the center in the Western saddles, needs to have enough space to miss the spine. The, sp the saddle is actually going to slide slightly to the outside as you turn. So if there's not enough room in the middle of the saddle for the, for the spine to actually bend, and for that saddle to move, then the horse is going to find going around corners difficult. So they may go well on the straightaway, but when you come to a corner, you find that, um, that they are starting to become resistant or they throw their heads up or they hollow their back because suddenly there is not enough room for this spine to, to move up and down and also not enough room for the spine to go sideways or to um, slide slightly to the side because it's going to move as the horse is in motion. In the western saddle we can actually choose the height of our gullet and we speak of the gullet as the space underneath the fork not as the space in the middle of the whole saddle. And you can actually get gullet heights that are different. So if you have a high withered horse, you're going to be asking for a higher gullet. And you also need the width to allow enough clearance for the spine. Some pictures of our English gullets, and we should be able to get three to four fingers between the two panels. Western saddles, you mostly have that as built into the tree. With English saddles, there are saddles that we can only get one or two fingers in between, and there's not enough room for the spine in here. Some of our saddle seat types of saddles don't have a very large gullet space and they have a very thin panel, which brings the tree, the hard part of the tree, very close to the horse's back. And we see that sometimes with some of the English jumping saddles, but more commonly with our saddle seat saddles. We will also see saddles where the style of the tree or the style of the panel narrows as we get to the stirrup bar area. So right underneath where the rider's thigh goes, sometimes the saddle makers think that it feels really nice to be close to the horse, and it does from a rider's perspective. It just doesn't feel very nice from the horse's perspective to be pinched in that stirrup bar area. Now that we've looked at the saddle basically on the horse's back, we have to look at the position of the girth so we can tie it on so we can keep it on. 
So every horse has a natural spot for the girth to rest. On some horses, it'll be about a hand's breadth or about four inches behind the elbow. On some horses, it will be almost directly behind the elbow, which is very far forward. And on other horses, it could be six or eight inches behind the elbow. And that's going to affect where your girth migrates while you're riding. Because while you're riding, that girth is going to migrate and end up in your natural girth depression and the saddle may travel with it. So if it's a very forward girth line, the saddle is gonna have a tendency to slide forward. If it's a very far back girth line, the saddle is going to have a tendency to slide back. This is where it comes in handy to have saddles that have creative girthing systems that allow you to move the position of the girth because there are many saddles that actually fit very well until you actually girth them up. And then it's the girth that becomes the problem. So for these horses that have a girth line that's fairly far back, if we're using a billeted system, we want to move and use the rear billets rather than the front billets. So there's three, and some saddles now have four or five or six possible places to put billets. There is a reason for that, and we wanna make use of them. So we can push the saddle forward by using the billets at the back. And if we've got a more forward girth line, we can put our girth forward. On many different saddles, there are creative systems. There are V types of systems. There are systems where the front billet is stationary and the rear billet can be changed. This one has a buckle on it. There are sliding systems where you can make adjustments and those are extremely valuable and you need to pay attention to having them the same on both sides or you'll actually twist the position of your saddle, um, but they will really help you in the long run. Once we get into motion, now that we've tied the saddle onto the horse's back, we get into motion and the saddle should be staying in place while we're riding. Saddles that slip around and slide around usually are doing that because they don't fit. Now, occasionally, if you have one of these really super round uh, fat horses or horses that are extremely well muscled, some of the quarter horse types and ponies and things like that, those saddles are going to have a tendency to slip. So you need to make sure that the tree really is truly wide enough for them. And if the saddle is slipping and you know that the tree is correct, then you can use something like a nonstick pad. But most of the time we're using a nonstick pad to just try and stick the saddle on when it's not fitting. So as the horse is moving, what we want to do is to look at how they use their back in their sport. Are they really rounding their back? Some horses really round their back when they're working. Some horses work with a hollow back. We want the rider to be able to stay in balance. And it doesn't matter what the sport is. In these pictures done by Susan Harrison, Horses, Gates, Balance, and Movement, you can see that the rider can be in balance in all these different sports if the saddle is in place and the rider is able to balance on top of it. So if the horse has a big raise to his back, really rounds his back, you may actually need a saddle that has a slight bridge to allow a place for that back to go. But some horses are never really going to pick their back up, either because of their sport or their conformation or the way that they're being ridden. 
And so you actually may need a little bit more of a curve to the bottom of your saddle in order to support that horse's back. So it becomes important to understand the types of movement of your particular horse. The rider balance is the next part because now that we've got our saddle on, we've got to get our rider on. And in this series of pictures, we can see that the type of riding does not depend on the look of the saddle. So we look in the bottom right hand corner and we can see a western sliding stop being ridden beautifully in an English saddle. And the same sliding stop can be ridden really badly in a western saddle. So the saddle is not affecting the, the way the rider rides. If anything, the English saddle is allowing the rider to be even softer than the western saddle. And we often get hung up on the style of saddle when in fact we want to be hung up on this, the fit of the saddle and the balance of the rider in the saddle. And if you're, unless you're going to do something like rope a horse, then you're going to have to have a western saddle with a horn. And if you're going to jump a jump, you really don't want a horn on your saddle because that will not work very well. But other than that, it's finding the right combination. And we have some very short-backed horses out there that can't wear a Western saddle. There isn't one that's made that's small enough. And yet you can do many Western sports in something like a treeless saddle or an endurance saddle or even in an English saddle. Quite a few of our endurance horses end up in English saddles just because there's not a long enough back to put a Western style saddle on. So then we come to the idea of pads and we all want the perfect pad that will solve the issue. And trust me, I would like that pad as well. It would make my life really easy. I would just say, buy this pad and you won't have any more saddle fitting problems. Unfortunately, it's not quite the case. So um, the pads don't prevent pressure points. Not the current materials that we have out there, even though every pad company says that it will prevent problems. What you do most of the time with a pad is you move the pressure point to a new location. So here we have the saddle without a pad. And let's just say we have a pressure point where this arrow is. And we add a pad, what we've done is move the pressure point to a different location. So this muscle underneath the padded area is now fresh undamaged muscle. And so the fresh undamaged muscle means the horse now feels great. So a lot of times you're going to be adding a pad and the horse does feel better. And it might feel better for two weeks. It might feel better for three or four or five months until this new tissue has become damaged. And that's the reason why we often buy a lot of different pads because they only seem to work for a short period of time. What we need to do is understand what's happening when we're putting the pads on and then make a decision as to whether this pad is a beneficial pad or whether it is a band-aid or trying to cover up a problem. Many, many times we add the pad and it's like putting a wool sock on inside your summer tennis shoe. There's not enough room. So you actually alter the fit of the saddle by putting too much padding underneath it. You would actually, if you want to use a thick pad, what you actually need to do is to get your saddle and make sure that it fits with that thick, thicker pad. And it's perfectly okay to use a thicker pad, but your saddle might actually be a little bit wider in order to accommodate and have enough room. You can't make it way too wide because remember we said the angle of the panels or the bars has to match your horse. 
but having it just a little bit too wide or a little bit wide, I won't even say too wide, allows enough room for a pad to be placed underneath it. The Western saddles are designed to have a pad underneath them because you only have a wooden bar, some fleece, and then you are expected to have a pad. And a one inch thick wool felt pad for many horses is, is actually one of the most forgiving therapeutic pads on the market. You can't use that under an English saddle because the English saddle has a panel. And so the English saddle in reality is made to use without a pad. And when it's fitting correctly, all you need is a thin pad. So we have covered what could be a three or four day clinic in 35 minutes. And if you have stuck with me for that long, there's certainly got a discount on my saddle fitting books. And uh, for those of you that might want to ask some questions, watching this on a YouTube thing, you have to go back to your webinars on air site to uh, type in your questions. And I'll be here for a few minutes to take questions. So anybody can type questions back into your webinars on air page. Okay. Um, how accurate is a heat sensing camera in judging saddle fit? The thermography cameras that are out there can be very helpful in looking at your saddle fit. The one thing you have to be quite careful of with the heat sensing cameras is that the evaporation from sweat affects the temperature dramatically. So, and the ambient temperature outside also affects it. So if you put a saddle on a horse's back and it's hot weather, then you may or may not see the differences in pressure nearly as easily. If you put it on with a thick pad, the pad will change the amount of heat that is reaching the saddle, and it will also change the way the pressure looks on the horse's back. So you really have to do some learning. There's a big learning curve to do a good, accurate job of it, and you have to pay attention to a lot of details. Next question is my thought on wool flocking versus foam fillers. Well, every saddle company has their own favorite filler, and they will tell you that everybody else's is no good. The truth is that there are real advantages and disadvantages to both. Wool flocking gives you more adjustability. There are many more people who are trained in reflocking saddles and, and adjusting saddles with wool. And if it's good quality wool, it feels excellent on the horse's back. However, you have to have access about once a year to somebody who can reflock it and keep it in good shape. If you make adjustments to it that are slightly uneven to fit a particular horse, as that horse changes, you need your saddler to be available to make changes to the saddle. With foam, kind of what you see is what you get. The truth is that you can work with foam and foam can be changed. There's just very few people who are trained to do it. So the disadvantage is that it's less adjustable, but if it's a comfortable foam, not too hard and not too soft, the, the advantage is that you don't have to change it and you don't have to have somebody work on it once a year. 
and, and that can be a huge advantage. There are some foams that are too hard, and foams do age. So a saddle that's 10 or 15 years old, may the foam may be starting to degenerate and get a little bit too hard. I have seen foams that were too soft, and you could actually feel the, uh, the bars of the saddle through it. A question about how to learn to fit saddles. Well, there are there are some courses. The the British uh, Master Saddlers Association does have a course, and I think it's gotten better and better over the years. There are a few people in the U.S. that are teaching saddle fitting and saddle flocking. A lot of people are learning it through the saddle companies, and you end up working for that saddle company, which can be okay. But like I said, not every, not every saddle, not every horse can be fit by one saddle company. So a lot of people would like to have the ability to learn how to fit multiple saddles. And there certainly are people who are doing that. But getting an education is not always the best thing. I would certainly look at the British Saddle Fitting Association. And uh, it takes a little bit of time to learn. It, there's an art to it. And it takes some patience. And I would encourage people who are interested um, to, to learn it. Because we really do not have enough people who are fitting saddles and reflocking and working with them. The next question is, um, how do you know if, if you have a bridging saddle or one with just enough room to give the horse a place to raise the back? One way that you can tell about the amount of bridge in the saddle is when you're standing at the side of the horse, you can do a little belly lift and reach underneath the belly and ask the horse to raise his back. And some horses are very painful to do that, so you have to ask them carefully. If they're very painful to do it on the ground, they may actually not be doing it when you're riding. And um, in which case, you may not need to have much of a bridge. But if you raise the horses back up um, and you see the saddle starting to to separate at the two ends, then you may need more of a bridge in the center. Because if you see the saddle starting to look like it can rock back and forth as you raise the back, and the horse is raising the back while you're riding it, you will find that the saddle is starting to rock back and forth, and you are having too much pressure in the center. If the saddle has the correct amount of space in the middle or in the area of bridging, the saddle will stay in nice contact with the horse's back as you raise it. And the other way will be to watch the horse or have the horse videoed in motion and see if you're noticing extra space at the back of the saddle or the saddle rocking while you're actually riding. Uh, what are my thoughts on the curvy shoulder relief girth? The, uh, sh those girths can actually be very, very useful, especially when you have a horse that has a forward girth line, girth line close to the elbow. Because a lot of saddles need to sit behind the shoulder blade, and where the billets come down is not far enough forward but if you actually move the billets far enough forward, you'd be too far forward in the saddle. So the girths that curve forward from the billets to the, the um, shoulder or the, the sternum often will hold the saddle in, in a better position. Now, the ones that are if you have a short girth for a dressage saddle or for a western saddle, one of the biggest problems is that people make those girths too short. And you need to actually have your buckles well above the elbow. 
and just below the natural curve of the horse's uh, belly. So in that case, just making a curvy girth is not going to solve the problem. The real issue is the, uh, the, that you need a longer girth. Question is that um, I was under the belief that the bar of the saddle should not go beyond the 18th rib. And it's the pressure of the saddle that should not go beyond the 18th rib. That is correct. Many, many of our Western saddles, the bar is going to go beyond that last rib but the key is to have it leaving the horse's back. And in, in my Western saddle book, I have a number of pictures showing you can put your hand underneath the skirting and underneath the back of the tree. And as long as it leaves the horse's back at that 18th rib, you're fine. And there's oftentimes with the endurance saddles, with the Western, the long skirted saddles, there is a, there's a lot of saddle behind the 18th rib. But if there's no pressure, it doesn't matter. It gives you plenty of room to put your saddle bags and everything else. So what you need is enough curve in that bar to allow that to happen. In our shorter backed horses, we need that even with our English saddles, we need enough curve at the back to miss that last rib, and yet we still need enough saddle to sit in. And some of us are tall enough, um, or either having a long enough thigh, or enough of a rear end that we need a little bit bigger saddle, but we just don't need the pressure on the lumbar area. We can have saddle sticking out there, we just can't have pressure. Um, what do you feel about a slick fork, wade trees needing to be closer to the withers for roping? For roping, you do need to be closer to the withers in the sense of you don't want a gullet that is way too high unless you have a high withered horse, in which case you still have to clear those withers completely, whether you're roping or just riding. The actual description of the shape of the fork, as in the wade tree, which is a, a common description of a shape of a fork, that part of the outside shape you can make any shape you want from having like the Australian saddles that have um, protrusions to keep your knees down to having a very slick fork. It's the clearance at the withers that's important. And when, if you are roping and your cow is tied off and the horse has tension in the rope, you still have to be missing that wither or you're gonna find horses that don't wanna hold the rope really well, or you're, they're going to become sore at that location. So you need enough clearance that at your maximum level of sport that you're still missing the withers. And the, there's often a rule where people will say, well, you have to have three fingers around the withers. And that's not true. You just need to have clearance at your maximum. Um, is there a rule about the center of balance of the rider and the saddle and the center of balance of the horse? There is, there is a good approximation, and actually it goes back to... Um, textbooks from 1876, the, the original saddle fitting book that was written back then, and they spoke about the center of the rider being pretty much over what's called the anticlinal vertebrae, or the, it's the, about the 14th vertebrae of the horse, and that's about the center of the horse's back. 
And we do want to be approximately over that um, 14th vertebrae with the center of our seat and the center of our saddle or the center of pressure of our saddle because I don't mind how much saddle is sticking out over the lumbar area if there is no pressure. So it's the center of the pressure. And you will find that that, that is a, not an absolute die-hard rule. We have a few horses that have really long withers, so you actually end up having to sit a little bit farther back. But um, that 14th rib is is a good rule of thumb and has been used in in history since uh, probably since the Xenophon times. Do we have any other questions? Well, thank you. Joyce, thank I you think all you have some over mm -hmm. to the uh, up at the top. There's the one that looks like you have some more questions in there. Okay. Um, I see one more question here, and then I'll look in the other thing. Uh, do you think that it's true that treeless saddles concentrate the rider's weight in one spot instead of distributing it over a larger area as with bars? Actually, you do, you do concentrate the weight a little bit. And, um, but what you really have with a treeless saddle is a dynamic rider and a dynamic horse and the two of you move are in constant motion. So you don't have as much steady pressure in one location as you do with a treed saddle. A really skinny rider I have seen um, ride a 50-mile ride and actually come up with pressure sores from underneath their seat bones. But that's a pretty difficult thing to do, actually, whereas we can do that fairly easily with a saddle. We can actually create a sore. And that's partly because the rider is in constant motion. One of the problems with some of the treeless saddles is actually the constant pressure from the way the girth is, um, the way the girth ties on to the horse's back because a lot of times the straps go over the top of the back both for the uh, stirrups and the girth itself so we will see white hairs sometimes appearing we will see pressure points appearing where you actually hold the saddle on the horse's back and Saddles like the Bob Marshall, which have a more of a V system of girthing, actually work um, a little bit, a little bit better sometimes than the treeless saddles that have a girth that goes over the top. In, in general, on the treeless saddles, treeless saddles can be very, very useful, especially for some of the difficult to fit horses, if you pay attention to the girthing system and pay attention to how easy or, or how well the rider fits on top of the horse. And the whole treeless saddle thing can be interesting at times because the more horse you have, the wider the horse is or the thicker the thigh is, the harder it is to get your leg around the horse itself. So pay attention to how comfortable and balanced you are in a treeless saddle. Okay, I have a message to tell my mother hi and I will definitely do that. Now let's see if I have more questions. Oh, here's some more questions, okay. Um, any guidance on a treeless saddle for a very round horse that is difficult to fit properly in a western saddle? 
this is where this is kind of a continuation to the comment that I started to make with the very round horses sometimes sitting on them with a treeless saddle can be very difficult because it's really like sitting on a barrel and what you find is that your lower leg is you're unable to really be solid in the stirrup your lower leg is flap flapping in the breeze and that leaves you feeling very unsteady there are some treeless saddles where the they are trying to build up a seat basically which is a place to put our pelvis and um, that can help you use a treeless saddle on this kind of a really wide horse you also on the really round horses with a treeless saddle because you don't have a lot of tree to kind of hold shape the shape you may need a non-stick kind of saddle pad to keep it in place and keep you from um, sliding you or you may need something like a crupper or a breastplate to help hold it in into place it is very hard to find treed saddles that are made for our very wide horses and yet we have a lot of very wide horses um, so give the treeless thing a, a try. The, um, the treeless with, again, the Bob Marshall has a little wooden tree at the front and a little wooden tree at the back and might give you a little bit more purchase, but there's not much for your seat in that type of saddle. You have to look at some of the other brands. Question is, do I also reflock saddles? And I, I personally am not a reflocker. I may have to learn one day if we, if we, one of my favorite, favorite ones just retired around here. So, um, but at the current time, I don't. The, uh, but, but I do recommend that reflocking um, can be done to change the fit to a certain degree. What do I know about the corrector pad by Len Brown? Um, I'm very familiar with the Orthoflex saddles. And the corrector pad is one of those things that's kind of a nice idea and probably works under a few horses, but in, in my experience has not been the fix that it appears to be. And many of the pads that people add will work underneath certain saddles on certain horses. And the next question is, is also about padding. So do the gel pads that conform to the horse's back um, still add too much padding? All of this is really, um, it's totally variable. I have some scans on, on the computer when I used to have a computer um, saddle fitting device where I had a gel pad that was, it made one saddle fit absolutely perfectly, but the saddle itself actually fit the horse perfectly. It just had no flocking, probably hadn't been reflocked in 20 years. So the tree shape and everything else fit well. That same gel pad underneath another saddle that did not fit the horse well had one of my worst scans. And that's the classic example of all of the pads is that you have to really look at how it interacts with a particular saddle and a particular um, horse's back and then so you sort of reevaluate your fit after you've added the pad and see if the saddle is still fitting. Another question is how well can treeless saddles actually work? They actually can work very well if you pay attention to the rider balance in the saddle and um, you watch where the the billet straps and the girth straps are. They can be extremely comfortable when you have the right the right rider horse combination and that comfort can be both for the horse and for the rider some people really really love them and I know a lot of horses that do really really well with them 
Question is, how do I deal with different sizes of withers? The, the key with withers is that you need to miss them. And the way that you miss a set of withers is almost to pretend that they are not there. We are trying to fit the horse's back and not the withers. In order to then miss a very high set of withers, what you have to do is thicken up your pad evenly all the way along and oftentimes cut out a slot. I usually cut about a one and a half inch wide slot to allow the withers space to hang out in the air. And I've got pictures in both the books, the Western and the English book, showing how to make these wither pads. The classic wither relief pads that are being sold with a hole for the withers usually backfire really well and they make great cat beds because the edges of those end up right underneath the edges of the panels. Please advise on fitting saddles with short on short-backed horses with long-legged riders. Yes, we get lots of those guys, especially on the uh, the Icelandic ponies, because they can carry a very large person, but you only have 12 or 14 inches of back to put a saddle on. One of this is a place where treeless saddles often can be very, very a very good solution because it can be hard to find a tree that's short enough and has enough curve to stay out of the lumbar area. The real determination of your seat size is the length of your thigh from your knee to your hip. And if that is long, you are going to need a much larger saddle. So with the treeless saddles, you don't have to worry about any saddle that is putting pressure on the lumbar area because the rider themselves might actually be taking up most of the short-backed horses. And uh, you can also look for saddles that have either an English saddle with a panel that curves up sharply at the back and you can look for Western saddles, and there are some Western saddles made for Arabian horses. Um, there are some Western saddles that they try to make for some of the gated horses because they have a very long, um, a very long sh or laid-back shoulder frequently, and have less room for a, uh, a less room for a set to put a saddle on. The uh, Port Louis impression pad is a Port Louis impression pad less sensitive than the heat variation pad. I have used the Port Louis pad, and it is a it can be a very useful way to look for pressure points. The problem with it is that it itself is almost three-eighths of an inch thick. So some of the saddles underneath it, that's too much pad. And so it will lift the front of the saddle up some, it will tip the back down because it's just plain too thick. And I have seen other saddles where it gives a very accurate impression. I actually did a comparison with a computer in the Port Louis and we, were, we ran about 50-50 on whether it was accurate in the same kind of way as the computer. So you have to really think about it and, and uh, look at it. Looking at heat with a thermography thing takes a lot of skill and a lot of learning. Um, there are some uh, moldable there's a moldable plastic, I've forgotten the name of the company right at this moment, that is it's actually the same kind of plastic as we have our Harmony muzzles out of, that's a moldable heat. You, you heat it up and you mold it to the shape of the horse's back and then it becomes rigid. 
And that can be useful as long as you don't ship it in Arizona in the summertime and have it change its shape a little bit. And you also have to decide your balance of your saddle, which can be difficult with any of these um, measuring devices. My thoughts on baby powder on the panels. That can be a very useful way to look for pressure points and it's nice and inexpensive and it certainly gives you an idea of how well your panels are doing and then you can go back and look for your pressure points. Short-backed horse and long-legged rider. Please advise if no new horse is available. That's where we talked about looking at um, some of the treeless saddles. That would, that would be the place that I would go, is looking at, at a treeless saddle. Okay, more treeless questions. I think we've kind of covered that. Um, what are my thoughts on the flexible panel saddle? Well, there are a number of different flexible panel saddles out there now, Western and English. And the key is that the flex needs to, it needs to be strong enough to not flex in one place. So some of the Western ones I've seen end up flexing in one location and that will become the new pressure point. So with the flexible saddles and the flexible panels, when you have a, at least somewhat of a tree involved, you have to look at all the same aspects of saddle fit. And this is where something like the Port Lewis impression material um, can be somewhat helpful because it may tell you that there is a point at which the panel flexes. This is where certainly the computerized saddle fitting devices um, can be very helpful. But again, the, with computers, it's garbage in versus equals garbage out. So you have to very carefully evaluate the information you're getting from a computer and make sure that it makes sense. Make sure that the people know what they're doing. I have a saddle that appears to fit very well. No pressure points or rock, but it slides back behind the withers while you're riding. Well, the first thing that you have to make sure of with this question is that you have already put it behind the shoulder blade because so many of us have been trained to put the saddle up on the shoulder blade and try to tie it on too far forward. So the saddle has to contact behind the shoulder blade. If you are already behind the shoulder blade in the correct location and, um, and you're sure that it's fitting well and not too wide, then you have to look down at your billet and you may need to, to connect the rear billets or move your billets back. And billets often can be moved, even in uh, Western saddles. The Western billets, if they're attached to the tree, can be moved. The English saddle, sometimes you can move billets quite simply. And um, that should help push the saddle forward. So any other questions? I'm going to go back to the other Q and A thing or the chat thing. Okay, got a bunch back here. Sounds like everybody needs to get my book. Um, Uh, what do you feel about the degrees, 90 degree, 92 degree, et cetera, to purchase a saddle from a saddle maker? From the Western saddle makers, the degrees are how they make the saddles. And 
the angle is much more standardized in the Western industry than it is in the English. So if you have measured a 90 degree angle, you're going to get a saddle that has that same 90 degree angle and it's more likely to fit than if you try with an English saddle to give them a specific measurement. So I, I do show in the Western book actually a way that you can make yourself a template um, to go underneath the saddle and get all of your measurements and you can make it, make it very simply yourself using cardboard and measuring tools. Is there a tool out there to measure bar angles on a Western saddle? There may actually be. I, I have not run across it, but um, you, can, you can almost these days take your smartphone and put an app on it that measures um, angles. And there are some, there's a few sort of saddle measuring tools out there that you can get an angle on, but really all you need to do is um, you can take some you can take some cardboard and figure out your angles. Best pad for a sway backed horse in a jumping saddle. It's impos impossible to flock it that much. So when you when you have a saddle that is basically fitting, but you have a big gap, like you have a sway-backed horse, and that's his shape, instead of trying to overflock it, then what you need to do is to add some shims to your saddle pad. We don't want to overflock the saddle, or we don't want to flock it uneven very much because we don't want to damage the saddle itself. We're much better to much better off to put it um, in the pad in the form of a shim and build it up from the pad side. And there's a number of shim uh, companies on the market and you try to fill that in, that area in as much as possible with shims and don't create a new pressure point. Make sure your shims are nicely beveled at the edges. How do I feel about the CSI pad? And I have actually, um, I have actually not worked with one of those, but it seems to me like it's going to be an interesting, um, an interesting device that I probably really need to sit down and work with on a computer to see what's really happening underneath the saddles. The concept though is I think a good one and I'm not going to sit here and say that I know that it's going to work but it's probably one of the better ideas that's out there. Okay, I think, I think we've gotten everybody. So thank you all for attending and uh, we will do some more webinars in the future. There's a comment. I'm very familiar with CSI pads, one of the best around. And I think with, with any pads, you will see sometimes dramatic results in some horses in some situations. So you really have to look at how it works underneath your particular pad and situation. Um, so thank you all for coming and uh, we will catch you next time.